There's something going on tonight, isn't there? Is there? Is that? This is not a normal Saturday night service that I'm used to here. When I come, usually there's, you know, there's a lot of great people here, but this is a lot of great people here. <laughs> this is really, I mean, look right and left. I mean, there's some great people here. I mean, you see all these people here? Oh my, this is great. So something must be going on. Um, well, I, I guess, I mean, Carl, I guess we're here for you, huh? Is that how it works? That's, that's what I've been told. That's what Sharon told me to come and do. Um, but Martha told me, and um, see, I just do what I'm told. This is, this is, you know, Associate Pastor 101. Um, but really, uh, we are here to celebrate together. We're here not only to celebrate uh, a day in which we get to rejoice with one another, with what God is doing in and through us in this place here as the Prince of Peace community, uh, but also we get to rejoice as we get closer and closer to Christmas. I don't know about you, but uh, the kids at my house keep getting a little more excited, a little more excited, and I include myself in that part of it, uh, about Christmas coming. It's always such an exciting time. Uh, we're in the middle of Advent, our second week, and we're continuing our series about how God is in the midst of this mess. Uh, and I think that this week, you've seen a bit more of the mess than maybe you usually have, right? Uh, it's a hard thing, and I hope that you took last week's message to heart, that God is with us all the time, that in the mess of history, in the long span of history, God is faithful to his promises, right? And last week, uh, we saw that he is faithful, and he uses his people, right? People, when you looked right and left, you saw a lot of great people, didn't you? Well, when you looked right and left, you also saw people that were very, well, they weren't perfect, right? Now, you don't want to tell them that to their face. Don't, uh, this is not what I'm advocating. But we know that because we know ourselves. We are not perfect. God uses imperfect people. And through these imperfect people, he has been faithful to bring his Savior about. That Savior is the one who was born on Christmas that we're so excited to celebrate again. The Savior, Jesus, right? His name is Jesus. And last week, during the genealogy, we saw that the, the counting of the 14s and the Davids and the promises that God held throughout the generations was really neat, wasn't it? This week, we're going to see how God uses names to tell this story again, how names are incredibly important. So I hope you heard what Martha said. If not, you've got a page in the Bible in the pew in front of you. If you'd like to go to Luke chapter 1, you're more than welcome to go there. We're going to refer to it today as we talk about names and how God is faithful to us through these names as well. So I have a couple things for you, a couple names I want to throw out there for you. Uh, the first one is this, uh, Kadabra.com. Anybody familiar with this website? Anybody know this company name? No? No? Uh, well, I mean, it also goes by this other name called Relentless.com. You ever went to Relentless.com? I know some of you in the back have got your phones. I could probably go in there right now, right? <laughs> Relentless.com? Well, I will, I will, well, I'll go right to the punchline. If you go to Relentless.com, guess what comes up? No. <laughs> Amazon. Believe it or not, Jeff Bezos' first name that he wanted to use for Amazon was Kadabra.com. Decent name, until his lawyer told him that when they were using it on the phone, people kept asking him, what? Cadaver.com? Cadaver.com? And then he wisely chose not to use that name. Names are important. Names mean things. If you go to Relentless.com, you will actually still go. It will point to Amazon.com. Jeff Bezos bought that domain many years ago and is still keeping it. Uh, it just, well, I guess it's relentless, I suppose. Um, Another name from the past, a blast from the past, the recent past, here you go. How about this one? Uh, Quickster.com. You ever heard of Quickster.com? Familiar with the assumption? This one's a little newer, right? Quickster. This was a failed experiment by the company called Netflix, right? Quickster.com, Netflix. It was when they decided to split off their DVD portion with the streaming. I didn't know Netflix still does DVDs, but... They do, evidently still, and it's called DVD.com. If you go there, they will ship you your DVDs three at a time if you like. But the name Quickster never stuck. Nobody got it. Nobody remembers it, right? It has no meaning anymore except for, well, failure and lots of lost stock profits. Names are important. What about people's names, right? 
What about people's names? Let's go to one of the more popular names for girls that's catching on today. Anna and Anna. I'll give you one reason why. One guess. <laughs> one possibility. This name is shooting up the charts over the last two years in popularity. While Disney already had an Anna before, they had Anastasia. Right? In 1997, that movie came out. Anna is a shortened form of the word Anastasia, which in Greek, Anastasia means resurrection. Resurrection. What a neat name to have, right? You could, you know, a shortened form of resurrection. What great depth to that name, right? What about another name? Joshua, right? Joshua. Anybody know what that one means? Yeah, here, let's go. Here's what it means. Yahweh is salvation. The Lord God is salvation. He brings salvation. What a great name, Joshua. All right, these are all popular names with kids these days. Think about your names, the names of people around you. What do they mean? What impact do they have on your life? And, you know, in the midst of the craziness of this world, in the midst of the mess uh, that it seems to swirl all around us, sometimes we forget how important names are. But we need this message of Joshua, of Yeshua, of Yahweh is salvation. We need this more and more. We need to keep our eyes focused on the promises that God has for us, that he brings salvation to us. So uh, we see this, well, we don't have to look too far. Uh, there was a headline in a newspaper this week that read as such, God is not fixing this. Did you see this? This was floating around everywhere, right? Um, that's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? Pretty bold statement. At the end, it talks about prayer, and it talks about how maybe prayer doesn't work, and there's a whole, there's an entire commentary going on in, in just the space of this headline, right? Um, you know, you don't want to sit here for three hours. We're not going to debate the entire commentary. Or do you? No. <laughs> just making sure. The people get their dinner ready. But yeah, I, I, not good for me. So, um, but what we see is this question. Where is God showing up in the midst of this mess of a world that we live in? Where is he showing up? Where is he? Even the newspaper headline writers are crying out. Where is he? What's our answer? Dr. Meyer, Dr. Dale Meyer, the president of Concordia Seminary, pointed out kind of the, the point behind the point here in response to this article. He said that we're missing the entire point. The mess is here. The mess is here and the mess is pervasive. The mess is because of, well, because we have walked away from God. We have walked away from God, not just in certain issues that you can think of, but in all that we are, in all of humanity since Adam and Eve, we have walked away from God. And God keeps calling us back and he keeps being faithful to his promise, but we keep walking away. We need the salvation of Yahweh. We need Joshua. We need that promise. We need that God who is faithful to his promises. And here today, we get to see how faithful God is because the healing that we long for, the healing that we know that we need, the healing that can make everything right again, God provides. He provides it through his son Jesus. Advent, this time where we know that Jesus has come and we wait for him to come again and to return to make everything new is the perfect time to focus your eyes on this yet again. Yes, so it's time to talk about Zechariah and Elizabeth then as well because this healing issue uh, is a hard thing. Christmas time, right? Did you guys make it through Thanksgiving without the political conversations at dinner? Mm, maybe, maybe, kind of, sort of. You looking forward to Christmas? Yeah? yeah? I mean, there's some, there's some messy stuff that we can get into, just at these really awesome times where we have time to be with our family. We can still make a bit of a mess of it, can't we? But with Zechariah and Elizabeth, we see a mess that, well, really wasn't their fault. It was just a mess that they were caught up in. This mess of infertility. This mess of suffering through days and years of not being able to have the one thing that they wanted most. So here's, how, here's what it says. It says that the Lord, uh, it says that they both had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very good. 
So Luke just kind of lays it out right away. This is their life. This has been their life for years and years and years. If you were a person who was able to have children, you know you have one child. And what's the question that gets asked to you most often in the next six weeks after you have that child? <laughs> when is the next one coming? Right? Right? It's, it, there's just no end to this. There's no end to this, right? Imagine not being able to start with one. Right? This is a hard thing. This is a hard thing. Today, uh, I, I scoured through the CDC website today to see how this impacts our lives today. And I, these two statistics jumped out. Over 24% of women in childbearing age, uh, which is officially between 18 and 44, 24% have struggles with infertility. That's a, that's a much bigger number than I expected to see. That means a lot of people around us, not just women, but men as well, are struggling with this silently. But as we go towards a time when we're celebrating the birth of a child, this one who came to save us, that they're excited about that too, but there's this thing in the back of their head, this deep suffering, this pain that just won't go away because they don't get to enjoy that right now. They've wanted it, they've longed for it, they've asked God, they've prayed, and yet they still don't get to enjoy that. And this was Zechariah and Elizabeth's life. At a time when many people wondered, would God even show up in their lives? Was God forgetting all about them? Did he care about Zechariah and Elizabeth at all? The suffering is difficult. And you know in their little town, towns were little back then, right? In their little town, people knew who they were. And this childlessness became part of their identity. You know, you get to know the people in your town. You get to know the people you see every day. And, and you start to use monikers for them, right? Oh, yeah. Well, there's that, or there's, there's that guy who, he's the one who always takes care of his yard. Really, really. He's meticulous, right? And now with snow, it's the same way. You know, these, you know the people in your neighborhood. Zechariah and, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Zechariah and Elizabeth were the people who didn't have any children. Their names became synonymous with this position. Think about the mess that they were in. Think about their identity, who people knew that they were, who people thought that God thought they were. And yet, if we know anything about God, if we've learned anything about the way that he's dealt with his people throughout history, we know that he is faithful. We know that he always comes back, that he always seeks after his people, that he chases after them with his love that is so much bigger than the love that we are able to share with each other. It's so much grander because it's love that gives freely of itself and expects nothing in return. It's love that, that sacrifices everything just for people who one day will swell, will shout words of praise and in the next turn our backs and act like he wasn't even there. This is our God who is faithful to even us in this messy business. So what does it have to say about Zechariah and Elizabeth? What are we missing here? Why are they in this story? Where would God show up? And if you have any doubts about this, what happens is you start to see, and, and as we're going through this Series, we're trying to get you to see the Christmas story, the same story you've heard over and over again, with some new eyes, some eyes that see it with kind of first century lenses. And, and imagine, if you will, that, that you understood Hebrew, right? And you knew what names meant, right? If I said the name Joshua, you would say it means... Oh, you do speak Hebrew. This is good. All right. This is, this is very good. Um, what does the name Zechariah mean? Well, here's what it means. The Lord remembers. That's pretty good, isn't it? That's pretty that, that's that's hopeful, right? Where is God? Well, God remembers. He doesn't forget about Zechariah, does he? Well, when you put Zechariah and Elizabeth together, guess what guess what Elizabeth means? There we got Elizabeth. What does Elizabeth mean? Elizabeth means the oath of God, the promise of God. When you put Zechariah and Elizabeth together, what do you get? God remembers his promises. Where is God in Zechariah and Elizabeth's life? He is right in the midst of their mess. No matter what the townspeople say, no matter what their doubts say, he is right there with them. And at this 
time and at the proper time and at the proper place and in all in the, in the big scope of God's plan, Zechariah goes into the temple. It's his turn, and he gets to see the angel Gabriel. Right? Oh, this is, this is amazing. In the midst of this mess, he gets to see the angel Gabriel. From Luke chapter 1, uh, verse 11, it says this. Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for God has heard your prayer. Zechariah, right? The Lord remembers. He has heard. He's remembered. Here he is. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son, and you will name him John. It's a great name, by the way. <laughs> Since we're talking about names today, an angel comes to Zechariah, and he finds out that it's going to be baby time for him and Elizabeth. And he laughs, and he wonders. Just like some other people in the Bible, right? Abraham and Sarah, and we have lots of others. Hannah as well. God is doing something new here. Through this wonderful child, they will name him John. And if they couldn't figure out what God was going to do through them, what should they do? They should look at the name. They don't even get to name their own son. God named their own son. Why? Well, because there's something special going on. Now we have three names, right? So we've got Zechariah, which means... God remembers. Elizabeth, the oath of God, he remembers his promises. And John means, well, John is interesting. John is two words put together. It means Yahweh and grace. Some people say it means the Lord is filled with grace, the Lord is graceful, the Lord gives grace. But it's really Yahweh and grace. And so we see that the Lord is remembering his promises, and the fruition of those promises coming together is what? It's God coming in the midst of the mess with a whole bunch of grace. Right? How neat is this? You start seeing this come together just with the names. If you knew nothing else about the Christmas story, you can see that he is funneling his story into and through these names. He's showing us what grace is all about. Do you know what grace is all about? What's our acronym for grace? God's riches at Christ's expense. Even in the story of Christmas, we get this sense that something is happening here, that Jesus' life is going to be different, that his expense is going to be our gain, and John is going to be the one who will talk about it, who will herald it. We see this in Luke chapter 1, verses 15 and 17. It says, the angel tells Zechariah he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. He'll prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. So this funnel is making its way down, the story of God's faithfulness, that he remembers his promises, that he will be coming with grace to do what? Well, the angel shows up a little while later, doesn't he? About six months later, right? And he tells a woman named Mary and a man named Joseph to name their baby what? Jesus. Jesus. Right? The name of Jesus. And what does Jesus mean? Yes. Yahweh saves. The Lord saves. This is the story of our God, who has come into the midst of our mess, who has come into the midst of our world that is so fraught with craziness and things that we never thought we would see in our lifetimes, things in our specific lives that are broken and hurting and painful that we often suffer with silently. And he says, look, I remember my promise. I will be faithful to my promise. I will come with grace and I will bring salvation. who I am. That's what I will do for you. So we've got these four names. Zechariah, Elizabeth, John, and Jesus. This is God's story funneling its way down, finding its way to the manger where God finally comes in human form to be God with us. And they call him Jesus. The kingdom of God making itself known, turning everything in the world upside down so that those who are found in Christ would see the world with his eyes. This isn't just about names so long ago and understanding the roots of Hebrew names and, and what that all means. This is about us today and, and our names. We have all kinds of different names from all kinds of different backgrounds, right? Some of us go back to Hebrew, some to Greek, some to, uh, some to German, some to English. Some There are lots of different names out there. There are even names that we've created in the 21st century. Did you know that? We've created names. And uh, I was looking at the list, and the name Jaden uh, was the number fourth name for boys in 2010 and 2011. And the etymology of that name is 
It was created in the last five years. That's it. It has no other meaning. It's a created name. They had nothing else to say on that. We have all kinds of names. But in Jesus, in the one who saves, in the one who God brought grace to show us, he has written a new name on our hearts. And Paul tells it to us like this. He says in Galatians 2, he says this, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Those of us who are Christians, who have been baptized into the waters uh, of God's grace, have been given a new name. Christ has come over us and has shown himself to be the light in our lives. We've been given his name to show the world. We keep our names too, the Jadens and the Adens and the, the Adams and the Joshuas and the whatever it is. But we get to have Jesus' name as well. The name that says Yahweh saves, the Lord saves. The Lord remembers everything. He brings grace and he, he saves. And we get to shine that everywhere we are. It's an incredible gift in the midst of this mess that we find ourselves in to point our eyes to Jesus, to point our lives toward Jesus, to make his name known in the midst of everything. So I encourage you, as you go through uh, difficult times this month, as the craziness of the season and, and of December and of family things and all the schedules gets you down, remember it is no longer I who live here, but Christ lives within me. My name, even, my name speaks Jesus to the people around us. What a great God we have. What a great God we have. Let's close the word prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us today for allowing us to well, to take a few minutes and think about the names in the story and how you, just by the simple names that are there, have, have shown us your faithfulness and your plan and your goodness for us. Allow us, Lord, to, to be a part of this as well, as you call us by your Spirit to go into our world and to look at the brokenness and suffering and the mess that's all around, and not to despair, but to have compassion and seek justice at the same time. We pray it all in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Yeah.